guest today is Marcel DeVries. Marcel, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. I want to talk to you about um, coded UI tests. I don't hear a lot of people talking about that. No, well, it's one of my favorite topics. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I'm glad they picked it for VS Live this time. So, uh -huh. yeah, it's coming right. up this afternoon, right? Yeah, this afternoon, last uh, last session of the day. For All me. right, so, yeah, <laughs> that's good. What's uh, actually before we talk about that? What what do you do for a living? So uh, I work as a technology manager for a company called Info Support in the Netherlands. Uh, we are a consultancy shop. Uh, we have about 350 people on the road every day doing Microsoft technology, uh, Java technology. Um, we maintain software for large customers. Uh, hmm. My primary job is working at banks, insurance companies, and help them with application lifecycle management. Mostly in Europe or all over the world? Mostly in Europe, so mostly in the Netherlands. Even. Okay, so yeah. All right, all right. Coded UI tests. Uh, what are they? So Coded UI is a technology which is part of Visual Studio, uh, premium and up, mm -hmm. and uh, it can help you automate uh, UI tests. Um, and with uh, UI tests, I mean that you can click the UI, um, go through the UI as a normal user would. Um, it can help you um, like uh, record um, the clicks that you actually want to do, and based on that, you can then replay that as um, a unit test. Okay, so it's recording it. So if I click a mouse button and I replay it, then the, you'll see the mouse button getting clicked. Yeah, exactly. And uh, what am I testing when I do that? So, so the whole idea behind code UI testing is that, um, at, at least the, the way I like to approach it, is that you have this whole set of unit tests that you normally would like to run, and those are just hundreds of unit tests that need to be very fast. Sure, call a function and assert that maybe the return value of that function is exactly. the expected value. Right, but the thing is that there are just some of those things that are very hard to automate or very hard to test. So if you take t take a lot of effort to build like unit tests for your UI, how am I if actually going to test the actual UI? If I do like uh, buttons that need to be enabled or disabled uh, mm -hmm. when certain data is, is behind the scenes, um, how do I go about and validate that that's actually the case? And if I make changes to the code, if that's still the case. So, okay. um, and with the recording, you can just record the fact that there are buttons. You can mm -hmm. um, specifically point to the buttons and, and, and get code that will address that exact button and, and get the data back for you. Ah, C-sharp code? Yeah, it's just C-sharp code. It's mm -hmm. just uh, fully integrated with MS Test. So the, ho the great thing about that is that you can then all of a sudden query your, your, your UI and then ask, um, so I ha see this button over here. Is it enabled? What's the text on the button? Um, all that kind of things. And you can click it as well. All right. um, and lately, they added features for Windows Store apps and, and Windows Phone as well. So you can do touch gestures as well, and you can um, um, work uh, yeah, with XAML uh, as well. So. so I get the idea that you can start recording, and then it'll know that your mouse moved, that you clicked a button, that you uh, that you touched a part of the screen. But uh, how does it know that I'm expecting this button to be disabled, or that I'm expecting a value at this point in the so, screen? So Coded UI does not know anything. So okay. it, it, it only is a technology to record the UI and, and enable you to interact with the UI. Uh, it has this whole object model that you can program against, and the recording is nothing more than uh, recording what you're actually doing, then okay. specifying ways to find those controls using that object model, and then it will generate code for that. Okay. So what you need to do is, when once you have the recording, you need to write a unit test or a, a test in, in C Sharp, okay. and then use, let's say, that UI map to get to that particular button and say, I would like to click it, or get to that button and then query on that button and say, what's the value of the text that's on that button? Oh, I see, so the recording is just a starting point. It, yeah, it, it gives you some boilerplate t uh, code exactly. that's going to take care of the yeah the very difficult task really of uh, automating moving a well, mouse around and finding these controls by their idea. yeah. But, but the thing is there that um, I, I like to compare it to well you you know about JavaScript the good parts and uh -huh. the bad parts well I, I think that with coded UI what Microsoft advertises is doing record and playback but that's more like the bad parts. The bad parts why? Well, the bad parts because it does not give you any maintainable code base. Oh, interesting. So uh, what they do is they spit out this blob of XML, and then you and that will generate a bunch of C sharp code that okay. you then need to maintain. So uh, what I tend to do is I look at that stuff that they generate because it helps me learn the object model and know how to interact with it. But right. then I just code straight, like code first against the code UI object. So model so instead. you rewrite the generated code. 
yourself. So I'm discarding the generated code and just rewriting it by hand because okay. there are some very nice patterns that you can use. Uh, one of the patterns that I also addressed this afternoon is the page object pattern. Okay. Uh, and what you do is you abstract the user interface uh, like a class that you then will interact with. And in that class, you have the knowledge of how to interact with that particular part of the screen. Mm. So now what you can do is you can then write down your test uh, sequence in such a way that it, the sequence itself does not have any knowledge about the UI. It just knows that you want to click through something, you want to fill out some fields and then click OK for example. Okay. So the fun thing is then you interact with these page objects and what we do is the page objects themselves, everything that's on the screen, which is really an action that the user can act on, um, you would program that as a method and that would return a new page object. And if you do that, you get a fluent API. So all of a sudden, you can write down a fluent API and say, well, this is the start screen. And on the start screen, click, let's say, the home button. Then from the home button, go to fill out these fields, then click on OK. And that would be your scenario. So the, the, the object model you're creating is, has a hierarchical structure similar to the structure, the hierarchical structure of the screen. So for example, buttons are contained inside of a exactly. frame inside of the screen. Yeah, so that's the whole idea behind abstracting that away. Now the fun part is that when you make a change to that part of the UI, then you make the, uh, the developer responsible for making a change to the page object as well as part of the definition of done. So now all of a sudden your scenarios always keep running mm -hmm. while they make changes to the UI. Uh, okay, yeah, that, is a, that is a challenging thing because the UI is of course the right. most likely thing to change. It's, right. it's much more fluid than the rest of your application. Yeah, one of the biggest issues with doing code UI tests is making it maintainable so that when you make changes to your application, you don't spend hours and hours to get your test run again. That's because that makes the purpose of yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Testing. And that's the reason a lot of people discard UI testing as one of the viable options of doing uh, testing on your application because maintaining that interaction layer is, right. is a lot of work if you don't do it properly. Right. That's what I try to address in my talk is, is abstract it away, make it part of the definition of done with just making that little tweak in that specific page object that you created. And that way it will grow with uh, the application and that way you just have this additional automation harness that you can leverage. Interesting. Yeah, I've, I've seen some of the code that's generated. Sometimes it will go by the, uh, the XY coordinates, mm -hmm. which of course can change. All the time. Yeah, somebody that's... walks into the room and says, you know, move this button over 100 pixels. Yeah. Well, that breaks a lot of tests. Or sometimes it can go by the text. It'll, it'll search by the actual text that's on a button, the capture yeah. button, yeah. Uh, which can also change. Yeah. So, so there are different ways in, to get around that. So if you take a look at generated code, you see like mouse.click and then you see like the object and coordinates. So the coordinates are just used for a fallback mechanism. So they're not actually used at, as the first try. Okay. So uh, there are a lot of heuristics within Code UI to actually find something when the UI changes. So what they've done is you pass in the object that you would like to click, then it will actually find the object and then just go about and click that object. But if it cannot find the object exactly, then it will fall back to the coordinates so that it can still do a click if you did not change your UI at that point. So they have a lot of stuff in there to make the test more resilient. Um, I was actually on a project which was using uh, Citrix. They're running a Windows Forms app through Citrix. I don't know oh. if you've done this before, mm -hmm. but Citrix does not expose those objects inside of it. So all you get, the only object you get is the Citrix window itself. Yeah, that's that's the big problem. So it's like back. a transparent window, and yeah. behind that transparent window, they're doing their magic. So if you want to run code UI tests on a Citrix environment, you need to do the code UI test on the Citrix machine yeah. and not, not as that's a way of doing it. Yeah. Uh, that's the only way it's getting a challenge. Getting but well, the, well, it did work with you, but it went by coordinates. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it will fall back which to coordinates. Which is very fragile. Oh, that's very fragile. Oh, I, I, if you go by coordinates, that uh, I would not bother doing code UI. Right. Yeah. Uh, so once you have a code UI test and you're interviewing with MS tests, I've yeah. got MS tests, um, tests in a lot of my projects. And I'm uh, on a lot of my projects. I'm running continuous integration. Mm -hmm. I want to run all my unit tests mm -hmm. every time I do a build or every time I do a check-in. Mm -hmm. um, but my unit tests tend to be really, really fast unless they're coded UI tests. Right. Then they tend to be really slow. Yeah. What's how do I balance that out? So my opinion about that is that coded UI tests are not unit tests. Period. Okay. So you never run them as part of your CI build. It's just like an additional line of defense. Um, I I like to use them 
Um, so one of my other talks today is on release management and how you use release managers. So one of the things that I have in there that you have a release pipeline and what, as part of the pipeline and the deployment, you run the code UI test to do an additional layer of defense and see that your UI actually shows up as you expect it to be. Okay. And then go through some of your main scenarios that are very important for you as a business. So okay. let's for example say you're uh, an, uh, an online uh, shop. Well, one of your main things is that you can check out, that you can actually pay and all that kind of stuff. So those would be scenarios that you would always go through a code UI test, then validate that an actual user can click that and do that perhaps cross-browser even because that's one of the capabilities they have as well. So then you can just fire up Chrome, IE and uh, uh, Firefox and then look if the user is actually capable of clicking uh, right. those, those scenarios. And what you will find is that sometimes that breaks. So you can see then, oh, it breaks in Firefox or it breaks in Chrome. Especially with, with nowadays everybody using Chrome as a developer, you will see that a lot of IT users and Firefox users get codes when they're on the internet. So. Sure. So, yeah. uh, so you mentioned the web browser technology. But there's other actually web browser technologies for doing uh, uh, automated user interface testing. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, there aren't very many that do Windows Forms testing. No, uh, that's no. right. So, so that, that's one of the fun parts oh, about Windows Code UI. Yeah, so Code UI does all these technologies. It, it does not do Java, but it does do WinForms, uh, WPF, it does the XAML Store apps, it does the Windows Phone apps, and it does the web. Right. And on the web, you can do uh, three different browsers, so IE, uh, Firefox, and Chrome. Okay. And if, if you take a look at, for example, Selenium, which is one of the competing technologies, right. if you look at the web, you can see that, well, that's only web based, so right. you can only do web. So if it will pop up like a, a dialog that you need to select, let's say a certificate or something, your host. You need to use other technologies to get around. Mm -hmm. And for you, like, you can handle that. Nice. Is there anything we haven't talked about that we should? So one of the great things that I like about the code UI and, and MS test in general is that you can integrate it with Microsoft Test Manager as well. I ah. don't know if you have seen that, but Microsoft Test Manager is more like a test tool for functional testers. Uh, but the great thing is you can import those coded UI tests, make them like uh, test cases that functional testers can run, and they can use Microsoft Test Manager then to say, well, I would like to run this regression set, which is automated, and then push that off to certain machines they have as a test rig. Hmm. Okay. And that's very nice because then you can uh, make the functional test as part of the test team that goes through QA and then just uses automated regression tests as well and you get that reported back to your test plan and you can show what passes and fails. Okay, and that's what you're doing. You're doing maybe uh, once a day or once a release. Yeah, like that, it, that it, it really tests. depends on the scenario. So we have certain scenarios that we say, well, these are crucial if they break needs to fix the code right away. Yeah. Um, so those would be the ones that you have as a first line of defense every night. And then we have like more long running regression suites that might take a whole weekend or two run. Oh, wow. um, but even you really then, have this? Uh, yeah, so, so I just work for a customer which is a, a large insurance customer. And what they've done is they bought just an off the shelf product. But they have one problem. How do I test if the off the shelf product did change in such a way that I all of a sudden cannot do certain scenarios? Sure, that's, that's a big problem. With yeah, user right. it might not be my mistake. Of course, it's not my mistake. No, it's never good. But, <laughs> but I'm dependent upon a lot of yeah. other people's code. So, what we've done there is uh, since it's a web based app, what we've done is we just created 600 plus uh, UI tests that we go through. Um, and what we've done is we named the uh, the test that we build in such a way that we can then split out and say, well, these have to do with the certain processes that we need to go through. These have to do with certain products that we have as a company. And then now if we import that in MTM and our functional tester can say, well, we did these change requests. Based on that, it would have impact on, let's say, these two products. So now it can then do a selection with query-based suites based on the names of the methods. Mm -hmm. Like contains, for example, they can use that as part of the query. And then what they can do is say, well, all of a sudden they get back like say 50 tests that they need to run and then push that to a test machine. And then they can just do a regression suite just for two insurance type of products they have. Very cool. Yeah. So yeah, we actually do have these large sets of tests. That we <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty ambitious. An entire weekend just of running automated tests. Well, yeah. well, if, if you look at what Microsoft is doing internally, and, and if you see their test setups and what they do in automated testing space, it's just amazing what they do. So mm -hmm. um, they, they have running sets there that might even take, take weeks to, to go through. I need to see that. I'm on the inside now. I'm just enjoying yeah, it well, six months ago. So oh, wow. Yeah. I can uh, 
yeah. get a peek at that. Yeah. Uh, anything else? No, I think that, that more or less covers it. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, where can people find out more about you? So they can find more about me on uh, my blog, which is uh, http colon slash slash uh, infosupport.com, or blogs.infosupport.com, okay. and then forward slash Marshall V, uh, which is my alias, and they can find some more stuff on there. And I'm a Pluralsight author as well, so they can find stuff on the, the Pluralsight uh, training site as well. Which is a Pluralsight course? So uh, I have one Pluralsight course on IntelliTrace, uh, mm -hmm. which is, uh, of course, great debugging technology, and I have one course on coding device. So I'll check it out. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, that was fun. Thank you. So when you're in technology, it's hard to have friends.